Buongiorno, benvenuti. Good morning and welcome to all of you. Thanks very much for attending this meeting, which is uh, a testimony. What awakens um, the human being? This is the title of the meeting. This morning we'll be hearing to the we'll be hearing um, the testimony of Alexandra Filonenko, an Orthodox uh, professor. Well, I'm introducing him like this because of simplicity reasons. By training, he's a nuclear physicist, by passion, a theologian, and by profession, he's a philosopher. Teacher of philosophy at the University of Kharkov in Ukraine, where he lives, and also other universities, Moscow, Kiev, and Minsk. I'm really quite... Uh, agitated. And I wonder what I'm doing here. Perhaps uh, maybe you understand this uh, during the morning. Having to introduce this meeting, I was really very embarrassed. Uh, he asked me to introduce uh, him. He said, please do it. But in order to introduce him, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to introduce him and uh, introduce him to you. We became friends only recently, this year, during Easter, more or less, uh, during the Easter holidays, more or less. Uh, since he um, came across uh, the book from father to son, uh, my book on education by the RS Publishing Company, uh, he wanted uh, the Russian version of this book that he contributed to uh, translate and review. And then uh, he asked me to go and visit him in Kharkov to present the Russian edition of the book. We spent some days together. He also asked me to say something at the university about Dante, a small conversation on Dante with his students at university. And the thing that struck me most of him was that it seemed to me that he is a man who lives in his flesh every day the title of this meeting and the title of this testimony. He's a man who is astonished in face of the origin before everything which is born and given birth to. He is a man who recognizes an origin in everything he sees. He recognizes this origin and becomes astonished in front of what he sees happening. He, is, um, he hasn't got the problem of conquering anybody or anything. He allows himself to be dragged by what is happening, recognizing something new in what is happening to him, a new beginning that moves him and astonishes him. Talking to him and having to decide together what to say in introducing his um, lecture, you know, I thought that in order for you to understand what I saw him uh, do, I have to tell you about at least one episode that we experienced uh, together. Maybe you're aware of this already. I talked about this uh, the other evening, presenting the Book of Paradise, but I'd like to repeat it. When I was at his university at this meeting titled uh, Dante and the Stars, uh, then there were other words but written in those strange letters that I couldn't read. But the title was in Italian, Dante and the Stars. At the entrance of the university, he stopped and introduced a student of his to me, a guy who was maybe 24, 25 years, I think. 
and he was suffering from dwarfism. He's, he was very small, almost blind, and he told me briefly about his story. To make a long story short, he told me that he spent his childhood in a terrible way in uh, an institute for children with these problems. And then he said to me, I was lucky in my life. I was struck by luck. And I said, what? And uh, he said, I became blind. At the beginning, I thought that the translator was not translating well, but then I checked. And uh, really, he had said that the luck in his life was that he became blind. I wondered and asked why. And he said, because when I became blind, I was moved to a, an institute for blind children. And there, it was like music. All children used to play an instrument. We used to sing together organize uh, bands and concerts, and there I was born to beauty. I was also struck by his uh, passion for Dante. He told me that uh, he listened to the entire Divine Comedy to be prepared for the meeting. He uses uh, audiovisual means. Well, you know, it would be the dream of any teacher that one prepares like this for a meeting. In Ukraine, maybe this happens, this may happen. Anyway, we went to the meeting. It was perhaps the worst meeting in my life because presenting Dante in such a context with the difficulty of the translation and then, you know, when you say Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, some people wonder whether they ask you, they are your mother, your father, or your aunt, and you have to talk about hell, uh, purgatory and paradise. I was unhappy, but uh, when going out, I met Oleg again. I asked him, how did it go? And he said he was moved. And then uh, saying bye-bye to him in a formal way, you know how it is. Uh, you, I asked him, uh, can I do something for you? Do you need anything? Do you wish to have anything? And he was very serious and said, yes, I have one wish. I would like to see the stars again. I was really impressed, astonished. I still remember him every day, and if I look at a story star, at a story sky, I cannot but remember him. A young boy who really thinks that he was lucky to, beca to become blind. To me, he is the emblem of all human beings, of all readings of the Divine Comedy. Our problem, I think, is to realize that we have this need. We're all blind. We're all in a dark forest. And the most true thing we can desire if we're loyal to ourselves is precisely this. See the stars. Have an experience of the fact that all details, all aspects in life are related to the mystery that does all things. I wish I could see the stars again. This is what he said. I told you about this anecdote because it really shows what struck me of our guest, of our host, and he was the man who wanted to see the stars, and also Professor Filonenko is a man who wants to see the stars in the students in front of him and also in the um, visit to many Italian cities that he made. Another floor to uh, my friend Filonenko for him to tell us about this marvel, this wonder which reawakens the human being anywhere, even in the most unexpected places. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm really happy 
It's an honor for me that you all came here for this uh, friendly talk. And I'm really pleased that we have so many people here ready to listen to things which are so intimate to me. My presentation uh, takes place today in a year which is very special for our church because uh, this year we are celebrating the 1,025 years from the baptism in Russia. It's a long story. And perhaps it seems uh, strange uh, to you that we are celebrating 1,025 years. It would be logical to celebrate 1,100 years. But uh, these uh, last 25 years are the years of uh, my generation because in um, 1988 something new started for us. 1988 is the year in which the communist state uh, interrupted the war against the church. It's the year in which an entire generation of young people arrived to the church. People who encountered Christ thanks to the testimony of the martyr saints of the 20th century. Our church is both ancient and young. I will not speak about uh, the 1,000 years uh, that uh, have elapsed uh, right from the beginning. I will only concentrate uh, on the last 25 years that I personally witnessed. The fathers of the church said that it's impossible to see the realm of heaven unless you see it, at least in the eyes of a person. And the thing I would like to tell you about is encounters of this type. My story will be about how Christianity began. The first story I will tell you about is a biographical one. In my childhood, I was a model Soviet boy who went through the process, the entire process of Soviet education. I loved mathematics and physics very much. And to me, religion was something I thought could be useful, but was rather boring to me. The testimony of uh, Father Pavel Floriensky was the one that helped me change this uh, position radically. Because in those days, uh, the prevailing uh, theory was that uh, religion was a sort of compensation, of compensating mechanism. It was said that the disabled, uh, the sick, people were those in need of being supported by religion. It was said that religion was like crutches, crutches for people who could not stand on their own. And therefore, atheists would say, we are perfectly healthy. We need no crutches to walk, while the believers said, it is true, we are sick, we need those crutches. And to me, this was absolutely uninteresting. Suddenly, I came to know Father Pavel Floriensky. I know that in Italy, he is very well known. And I would like to tell you about some fragments of his life who were decisive to me. Before the revolution, he was a great uh, Russian thinker. He was a mathematician, an engineer, a poet, uh, an ethnographer, 
and was also an expert in perfumes and scents. But above all, he was a priest. And when the revolution took place, people soon realized, or he soon realized, that he could no longer be a professor at the Academy of Theology because the Academy itself was shut down. And therefore, the question, he asked himself a question, what is now my relationship with Christ about? And this relationship to him was the readiness and willingness to accept the challenges of reality. Electrification started in those days, and he became the editor of the technical encyclopedia. At the same time, he started teaching in an academy of arts, a left-wing academy, and was a teacher in the theory of perspective. And when the moment of his martyrdom came, he was sent to Baikal in Siberia to a lager, and all his family remained in Moscow. Now, it's not really the place to describe how terrible those lagers were, but to him, this meant that all his love for science had ended. He could not continue studying out of Moscow, but even in Siberia, he discovered two astonishing or three astonishing things. First of all, the beauty of ice. And so he started studying the science of ice. The second thing, the second astonishing thing he discovered was the soil of Siberia, which is um, always frozen in a frozen state. In summer, it becomes uh, a bit uh, softer, but in winter, it's like stone. On such a soil, you can't build anything. Yet, he created a lab to be able to build something on that soil. And the third astonishing uh, thing he saw was that not far from the lager where he was kept, there, was, uh, there were people who could not write. He started learning their language and discovered that this population had its own ethical history. So he wrote it down. He translated it into Russian. And at that point, he wrote to his family, still in Moscow, and wrote, here in Baikal, I have a very interesting life. I would like to build uh, a memorial for this population here. And said, you know, living in Moscow is too dangerous. Come to me. He invited them to Siberia. At this point, he was arrested again and sent to the lager of Salafki, where life was absolutely horrifying. At the exhibition on Martyrs, you can get an idea of this. And if you look at the pictures of Flaviensky when he was in that lager, they are really terrible. But even there on the shores of the ocean, he saw that there were seaweeds, algae, and he understood that iodine could be produced from those seaweeds. So he set up a small company to produce iodine. And then it turned out that that iodine was important in the operations of the Second World War. Flariensky was killed in 1936. 
the ear of the great terror and his family was not informed about his death for a long period of time. So they were still waiting for his news. When I was informed of uh, the story of Floriensky's life, first of all, a question came spontaneous to me. What is it that made him so live? Even in, uh, even in such a short uh, story, you can appreciate that his life was an impressive one, astonishing. Well, the answer to many questions uh, was clear to Floriensky because his uh, source of life was his relationship with Christ. It was clear to me that if uh, Floriensky was uh, disabled, then I had to stay with disabled people and not with the normal people who were so boring. And I had to discover what that relationship with Christ was. And in order to understand this, I had to follow him. And so Christianity to me was uh, the discovery of generation, the discovery of a way. But I had a problem. There was just one problem. Floriensky was dead. I could not follow him. And so I remember the day in which a friend of mine and myself told each other that we had to find at least one person to follow, a person who could take us to Christ. In order to find this person, it took me really many years. One day, this friend of mine came to me at home, very excited and moved, and told me, we have to listen to this cassette. I asked him, who is it? He said, it doesn't matter. Listen to his voice. We turned on the recorder and it happened to me to listen to a voice that I had never listened to before. There were many ideas and many thoughts in that recording. It was a too strong an invitation and the invitation I heard then was an invitation to follow Christ. My friend and I looked at each other and said, we have to go to that person. He speaks in a brilliant way, but we need to understand whether this person lives in the same way that he speaks. And after some years, as it, of, it often happens, when God plays tricks on us. In 1997, I really met that person. Antoni Dishurov, a Russian bishop founding the Orthodox Church in the UK was this person. He is now one of the most popular Orthodox authors. But the important thing was the encounter with him. Then I came to know many things of this uh, bishop, of the metropolite. I'd like to tell you a few of these things. He was born in uh, 1914 out of the Russian borders and lost his faith too early because when he was small, he realized that if he was in church and was breathing, he would faint. So he started to exploit this fact. And when his grandmother took him to church, he used to breathe in deeply so that the 
grandmother would take him home. The grandmother soon got tired of this and stopped uh, taking him to the church. And everything that uh, he heard about Christ um, suggested protest to him. He was brought up in the Boy Scouts movement and every day he was getting ready to go back to Russia. One day uh, they sent him a priest who wanted to talk uh, about Christ to him. Our hero was against. He wanted to go home but was told you can't go home because he is our sponsor you have to listen to him he came sat down took his book and wanted to be left alone this priest however was speaking in a very loud voice and was saying things that were absolutely terrible to him so he went back home quite uh, angry and told his uh, grandmother, if the gospel really contains uh, what that priest said, I don't really want to have anything to do with the church, but I have to check it out. Have we got a gospel at home? It's important to note that he was only 14. His uh, granny had a gospel at home. He took the gospel, understood that there were too many stories referring to the same thing. So he chose the shortest of the gospels. In the future, he used to say that uh, it was Mark's gospel, the greatest gift of God to him. He started reading the gospel and at some point in time he felt that there was someone in his room and very clearly so. He was convinced that it was uh, his uh, granny. He turned around and there was nobody and he understood that there was Christ in that room and that Christ was alive. And this meant that uh, in that book um, there was the truth. He would then uh, tell this uh, story during all his life not just what happened to him, but also his conclusions were astonishing. And please remember that he was only 14. First of all, he realized that all the people he considered as his enemies were indeed his brothers and sisters. The second thing is that he realized that God holds uh, human beings uh, in high esteem, respects them, and never destroys their freedom. Then he realized that the parable of the son was his. And uh, the other impressing thing was that Christ's uh, word on the cross uh, hit him. My God, why have you abandoned me? And he understood that this cry was the possibility of uh, being saved for atheists because uh, they were all forgiven thanks to Christ. And after that night, uh, he went out and uh, found himself in a completely different world. He says that uh, starting from that moment, he only wanted to ask a question to everybody. That is, have you ever heard about this story? And if yes, why are you so sad? You have to listen to it again. And he spent all his life doing this. In the 30s, he became a monk, then uh, a physician. He 
lived in Paris and therefore participated in the French resistance. After the war, he became a priest in the UK and founded a school for children. The reason why he wanted to found this school is impressing. An old woman went to him and asked him, well, and told him, nice that we have a young priest. Now we can live in peace because we know that there is someone who will bury us. And he got scared listening to these words. He understood that young people had to come to the church. Otherwise, he would have buried all the believers. So a community of young people was uh, established and many of them became priests themselves. And over time, the Surosh diocese was uh, established. And when I met him, I really understood uh, the substance uh, of his uh, charism, of his message. If you want to meet Christ, you really have to be ready for an encounter and willing to have an encounter with him because faith is born in an encounter. And to explain this, he always referred to Mary Magdalene. Once at Easter, he explained the birth of faith like this. He said, Mary Magdalene was the only person who went twice to the sepulchre of Christ. The first time he found it uh, empty and understood that her beloved had resurrected and started to cry because of joy. And these uh, tears are very important because she had understood that he had resurrected for all, but it was a separation for her. She would have never seen him again. And when she came to the sepulchre the second time, she talked to the gardener and cried. And she could not recognize Christ. But suddenly she felt that he was calling her by name. He called her Mary. And at that time, she realized that it was really him. It's very important that she understood this not through an intellectual process. But she heard a very familiar voice, similarly to the voice of our mother and friends when they speak to us and they call us by name. The Metropolite Antoni said that it's not enough to cry on Christ. We first have to discover these tears. But the faith arises in the same way that we are called by name. And it's astonishing that God calls us by name. But there is an even more astonishing thing, that is that God calls all of us Mary. Every one of us is called Mary by God. And we really understand that it's us that he is calling. And it's very important that the faith arises in that moment when we recognize God's voice and we lighten up because of the joy of recognition. The testimony is never an empty telling of facts, but it's always the fire of an event. And when I the movement, and when I encountered the 
movement, the most astonishing thing was that the school of the Metropolitan Antoni and Father Giussani's school are very close concerning one point, that is the possibility of meeting uh, Christ in uh, all encounters. In our life, we have many encounters. And the important thing is not that we have special meetings or encounters in our life, but rather the fact that each encounter contains the evangelical depth. Each encounter has in itself an invitation to the encounter with Christ. and. Therefore, Christianity is the possibility of seeing this depth. If we follow Christ, the result is that in all encounters we can see this evangelical depth. I'd like to tell you about a story on this way of, the, of seeing things. Once in Ukraine, a group of friends from the movement came. They told us about various aspects in the life of the movement. And they were mainly people working in the field of university, professors, uh, students, PhD students, and one of the uh, presentations lasted eight minutes. Rosalba Armando had uh, come from Novosibirsk to briefly report about the work of a social uh, cultural agency she had founded which is called Maxora and she explained of how a house was created where young uh, um, mothers could live with their children. I listened to this story and could not believe it uh, because uh, this uh, story took place in the 90s um, and actually it all happened to a person who did not know Russian, could not speak Russian. In the 90s uh, there was the threat of hunger in our country and uh, listening to her words uh, I had a feeling that uh, one could do incredible things. Uh, I was looking at her speak and told myself, it's impossible, it's impossible. But at the same time, I saw that uh, that was there. It was an impossible presence. And I very much wanted to understand how this was uh, possible. I was very happy because after that uh, encounter, everybody was only speaking about that. And some people asked me, we also have to do something like this. We need to understand better what is happening. And I told them, if you want to understand more, write a letter to Rosalba. And some friends called me and said, Rosalba replied, replied, ask Filonenko. I understood that from that day on, I had to deal with social work. So we founded an agency, a social cultural agency called Emaus. I imagined it to be a very small boat, really a tiny boat to be tied to an enormous, a huge ship. 
so that it would uh, fluctuate uh, from one side to the other while that huge ship was uh, heading forward. And by so doing, we would be able to achieve something. But in that case, we had a problem too. We did not know of any mother without, uh, who was single with children. We do not like to invent uh, problems. So we simply decided to wait. If God needs us, uh, he will tell us, he will invite us. And this occurred at a much faster, spe faster pace than we expected because a friend called me, he is virtually a saint, Vasily Sidin is his name. He is a person who 37 years ago in Kharkov founded a theater for so-called difficult children. He was like a father for many children in Kharkov. He died two years ago. But his story is a beautiful one because sympathy for the suffering of these young people led him to Christ. He was a great mentor, a great master, but there were things he could not do. So he called me and said, you know, our aliena has very a very big problem. We knew this uh, little uh, girl who had been uh, played in her in his uh, theater for a long time she was uh, very intelligent she was um, disabled she could not walk uh, properly she had spent um, her life in many hospitals and was thirsty for life when she finished school the state proposed to her that she would go to an elderly home. The only possibility that our state offers to children like this. And for the first time, I saw this uh, terrible reality. I asked Vasily, how can I help you? How can I possibly help you? And he said, it's me who should ask you what you can do for her. And I told him, I can try to help her continue studying in an institute. But her teachers told us, impossible. She knows too little. But we had two months' time. and had a very simple choice in front of us. Either send her to that elderly home where old people uh, simply had to wait until they died, or she could go to a technical institute, try to go to a technical institute. For two months, uh, we uh, studied with her. I remembered that once I loved mathematics, uh, and then a friend of mine who loves um, language and literature also taught her something so that Aliena could be accepted in this institute. The teachers said, well, she succeeded simply because, uh, you know, they were good to her. But in the two years that she studied at the institute, she got prepared for the enrollment examinations at university. 
She took the state examination. They did not know that she was disabled. And two weeks ago, we were informed that she was accepted at university. She passed the examinations. And two weeks ago, her teacher said that it would be impossible for this to happen. That's why we're celebrating the fact that M mouse is now real. It really exists. But when we started going out to these children to help them in a very simple way, I discovered something great about Christianity. Thanks to a bad little girl, there was a girl, and everybody knew that she was a bad girl, you know. It was well known that she had no kidneys, and every two days she had to go to the hospital for dialysis. Dialysis, you may know, lasts six hours every time. We also knew of her that she was smoking and cursed and that she liked chupa chups very much. The well, all, these, um, all this information was enough for me to go and see her in hospital with chupa chups, uh, lollipops. These uh, chupa chups were useful for dialysis. When she would sit on the armchair, it was easier for her to bear pain with chupa chups. I didn't even know how she looked like. And one day I went to help her in her mathematics studies. I was approached by a short girl, silent. She said that Snejana was her name. I was impressed, very impressed, because she did not look like uh, a cursing girl. She stared at us carefully. She was looking at what we were doing. And at one point, she asked, would you like to see some photos? And I said, yes. So she came to fetch. She went to fetch a small photo album. And the thing I saw in that photo album was the greatest and most terrible testimony of love. At the beginning of the album, there were black and white pictures, beautiful ones, with um, her dad, her mom, a very young family, two daughters. They had two daughters, but they Soon, the pictures turned into colored pictures, and those people, those adults, would become um, alcoholists and um, homeless. And in the colored pictures, it was easy to see that their home was like a dump, a dump site. It was no longer a home. Snejana finally made some comments. She said, this is my mom, this is my dad, this is my sister. And she said, that mom and dad died. She was old enough to know that she did not have her kidneys because they had drunk too much alcohol. She knew that she was dying because of those people. But in her voice, there was no sign of complaint, nothing, no bad signs. And I was struck by the fact that in her voice, there was not even any claim 
for me. She only wanted one thing, that someone would share her life with her, that someone would look at that album because there was only love in that album, nothing else but love. But she also, but she needed sharing, sharing that album. That album was the only thing she would, she would bring with her everywhere, even to hospital. She had nothing else belonging to her. Then I discovered that almost no one had ever seen that album. The dozens of people helping her did not care about her fate, but that was her only true desire, that someone was able to see the people she used to love, that someone would see what her fate was. So I understood what we were there for, because Christianity is the possibility of sharing one's own destiny. And so, from this ability to see, the community started to operate. There started to be friends for her. There are two ways of thinking of our relationship between our lives and the afterlife. We can think of the afterlife as the end of the worldly life. But I think, but I like thinking of it in a different way. To me, the afterlife is um, the introduction. And we live in a time where people don't l read the introduction to books. But I think that our earthly life is an introduction. It's a preamble, it's a premise. It only serves one purpose. It serves to meet friends for eternity, the people with whom we are ready to share eternity. And Christianity and Christianity makes this introduction indispensable. And the last thing I'd like to tell you about is linked to the questions that were asked during this life of ours. The post-Soviet society is sick, has got one disease. And strangely enough, in Europe, we have the same disease, which is the fear of the community. We lived so long in the Soviet Union that we are allergic to collectivism. Every man, every man is by nature an individualist. And to us, it was a very important uh, discovery when we understood that Christianity is above all a community. Even if you are absolutely on your own, because in uh, your heart, there's always a community. It's the community of those people uh, before whom, uh, before whose faces uh, the individual lives his or her life. And even the loneliest uh, person of all is rich in these faces. Well, the friends, our friends, belong to this community of the heart. But very soon we realized that apart from friends, we also needed another presence, another figure. We realized that we were living in a world 
which was uh, ready to make us live in a condition of orphans. We needed a father. And this is another allergy of Soviet uh, people because we had bad fathers. All the ideology system rely, relied on pseudo figures of terrible fathers. Suddenly, we found ourselves to be fathers, and we discovered that we had an increasing number of children, and we would not understand what uh, fatherhood meant. So God sent us the biggest uh, um, f gift of all in uh, uh, Krakow, um, Franco Nembrini. And now I'm going to explain this uh, because uh, the pathos uh, should not be so too exaggerated. But uh, thanks to Franco, I understood two very simple things without which I could not live. First of all, I discovered that the fathers are the people who can tell us uh, what life is worth for, worth of. So being a father, a father is very simple because it means that you are a testimony of the fact that it's worth living. The second very important thing is that he explained to us that the fathers are concerned of things that you should not be concerned, uh, missing the important uh, point. So they are concerned uh, if, uh, for example, they uh, look good or bad um, in the eyes uh, of their children. But since our children see us uh, in the most diverse uh, conditions, then there's nothing you should be concerned about because very often our children forgive us very much. To me, it was a very important discovery, knowing that I was forgiven by my children. And also the third thing is very important. There is one single thing which is difficult to forgive to your father, the lack of hope. But it happens that a father has no hope. The fathers need to be forgiven. So together with the fathers, part of this community of the heart are also or is also the saints. Those witnesses with who uh, bring joy and forgiveness with them. And these are great uh, gifts, and they are to be found in the community of the heart. And these um, gifts uh, invite us uh, to do something which is very difficult, a very difficult task, uh, which I call the personification of history, giving a face to history. Let me tell you about a small uh, anecdote. It's important to know that it's a, an anecdote uh, which is not Christian. It's uh, an anecdote of a woman who was a professor of uh, philosophy, a very well-known professor of philosophy in uh, Kiev. After her 50th um, birthday, she started a new job. She became an interviewer for Spielberg. This woman was blind, and uh, 
she interviewed more than 100 victims of the Holocaust. Some of the stories she recorded are very famous, but there are also some that nobody knows, except for the readers of Tracce. This uh, anecdote uh, took place uh, in Kharkov. Uh, the work or the task of this interviewer was uh, simple. She had to go out with uh, a cameraman and for some days uh, interview the person that she had to. So our hero went to a very old woman and discovered that her story of the Holocaust was a very short one because when she was about five, the Nazis went to her house and her mother could hide her under the stairs in a very humid place and there in that cellar she was able to realize that uh, her house was being burned everyone died burned and she survived the only thing she remembered for all her life was the smell of uh, uh, burned meat. She could never meet. Uh, she could never eat uh, uh, meat after this. Then she had a terrible uh, story. Many men who all died, and terrible stories with uh, her uh, children. She had a bad job, but the interviewer asked her. Well, it's impossible that only so terrible things uh, happen to you. You must have uh, a big desire, some big desire. And she said, I only have one desire, which is to die as soon as possible. I'm waiting for death. In my life, there has been nothing uh, good. and." Uh, simply because of the fact that the interviewer was uh, blind and they were the same age. She continued asking and said, you know, it's impossible. At least in your childhood, you always have some joy, some n nice memory. So the interviewer asked her, have you experienced something like this? And she said, no, no. Then she said, well, you must have a desire. And she said, she answered, if I have to be honest with you, I have one desire, but it's too fantastic. There was only person on earth who loved me, my mom. But the terrible thing to me is that I don't even remember her face. And I really have this big desire. I'd like to see her face again, but it's impossible. Our hero, the interviewer, started asking her, well, how can it be that you can't remember your mother's face? Uh, she said, I remember her very well, but I remember her back. Uh, do you remember any event linked to your mom? Yes, my birthday. Because uh, she gave to me as a present uh, very, s very nice uh, uh, boots, uh, hand sewn. But how is it that she gave them to you? Well, very simply, I woke up and she said, look, these are your new boots, but were they there somewhere? No, I remember that my mum asked me to try them on, and how did she do this? Uh, she 
asked me to sit down on a chair and she put them on put them on me but what was she doing then was she standing sitting or what well as usual see she kneeled down and she put them on me and while uh, um, trying them on she asked me uh, do they fit aren't they too small too tight and then suddenly uh, she um, stood there silent and said I see my mother's face and then for many months uh, that woman wrote letters uh, um, explaining that the only miracle in her life had taken place she had seen that face her mom's face when I uh, heard that story with all my body I felt that I was in front of the mystery of Christianity because we're living in an entirely anonymous world in the exhibition on Martyrs you can see how people can lose their face while there are others who can preserve their face in uh, terrible conditions and that's the saints we uh, Christians uh, are those who can do this uh, and give people back uh, give a face back to people it's a very humble uh, type of task it's something you can't organize but it's something we can't uh, give up we need to give a face to those places where there is prevailing anonymity and it's impressive the fact of finding again one's face is linked to joy in June this year I made the most incredible trip of my whole life thanks to Letizia Bardazzi and the Association of Cultural Centers in 20 days with Elena. We visited 22 Italian cities. And had an incredible amount of meetings. In this period of time, we saw enormous generosity. Every day we met uh, young people, adults, uh, young adults, uh, people whom I would have liked to follow during all my life. Every morning I used to wake up thinking, what shall I do? And uh, I, a new ideas, new thoughts, new perspectives came to my mind at some point I realized that there was no uh, sufficient human force uh, or there were no sufficient human efforts to do what could have been done but I was not discouraged or lost because of this because when we discover that we are given much more than we can accept, one point is clear, at least to me. One point as a prayer, ask the Lord to take you if he wants to become his arms, his hands, and ask the Lord to give you someone to follow. So the question on the nature of authority became very much to the point for me. And when I told about this trip to Julian Caron, 
I told him about this uh, three times quicker than here, he simply smiled. And ended up um, quoting words by St. Paul. And thanks to these words, it became clear to me what the friendship of the movement means. He mentioned the second letter to the Corinthians by St. Paul that you, of course, know very well. When St. Paul apologizes because he cannot go to Corinth, and there they expected him to be the head of faith. And he said, we are not apostles because we are the masters of your faith. We have this, we, it's not that we are apostles to have this power. We are simply the co-makers of your joy, the collaborators of your joy. And this feast of collaborating to everybody's joy is what I wanted to share with you in today's meeting. Thank you. Scusi. Scusi. È il mio Dice che non è la fine. It's not the end. Be patient. Please bear with me another five minutes because when we prepared the meeting, Franco told me a story which is so impressive um, that uh, at the beginning he uh, cried, then I cried, and then Elena cried. And then after crying, he said it was the effect of medicines. But we can't uh, go away from here without listening to this uh, story. It happened to me to meet, in an accidental way, some um, months ago, a lady. She may be, well, I don't know how many years, but a lady who many years ago I met in GS when she was really small and young. I had never seen her again, but when I met her again, She briefly told me about something that I would like to tell you. Well, you know, I saw her, and I don't know why, because um, I have a very short memory. I don't even remember what I did in the morning when uh, it's evening. People think that I'm a good person, that I forgive everybody, but the fact is that I don't remember things. This makes life easier to me. But then, uh, but in that case, I remembered that woman, even if many years had passed. And as it would normally do with a dear person, I hugged her and said, come here to my heart. She was astonished. And she said, how do you know that 
after so many years, I needed uh, peop someone to say, come here to my heart. Well, I said, everybody needs this. Um, I always uh, say this. She told me about her story. She had abandoned uh, Christianity. She had abandoned the church with great uh, sorrow and difficulty. She made um, very strange choices, adventurous choices. But sometimes she had a reminiscence, a rem a reminiscence something that uh, took her to a church for some pray prayers. Sometimes she had even been to masses uh, and taken communion. Her mother, a practicing Catholic, had always uh, experienced um, the choices of her daughter with great sorrow and difficulty. Uh, one day, uh, recently talking to a young priest, she told him about this uh, sorrow, the sorrow for uh, her daughter living abroad in a faraway city, making choices that her mother would not agree on. And the young priest said, write things to her and scared her. He told her that uh, her daughter, if uh, she had had an accident that day, she would have gone to hell, and that the mother was herself guilty of this uh, sin that the daughter had uh, made. Then the mother called uh, her daughter and told her about her suffering. Um, you know, the daughter got very angry. She felt a lot of rage against Christianity. She went out of home and she wanted to find a priest to spit on him and express all the violence that she had felt on herself, on her mother, by the church. She entered the first church she came across. She looked for a priest, but there was none. She looked in all confessionals and there was none. When going out of the church, from one little door, she saw a small garden, a bench, a fa and a priest sitting on that bench turned the other way. It was an old priest resting on his cane. He was so old that, old that she did not dare spit on him, but she told him about her hatred for uh, priests and the church, very bad words, insults. The old priest did not say anything. At some point, he succeeded uh, saying something and said, I appreciate, I understand, but do you love Jesus? And she started again for the second time with insults, curses, um, you know, he smiled and uh, when uh, she stopped uh, speaking, asked her, you know, I understand your point, but I'm asking you something different. Do you love Jesus? I was impressed because I don't know if she was aware of this, but she used this expression when speaking to me. She said, for the third time after more curses on my part, he said, do you love Jesus? I said, yes, sure, I love Jesus. He stood up 
He smiled at me, kissed me on the forehead, and said, go in peace. When, he, when she told me this and asked me, why do I remember that encounter so well? Why is it so fresh in my mind? I said, because you participated in a beginning. A beginning happened to you, and the beginning is everything that Philonenko said. You understand now why I'm following him, why we've become friends, because the beginning is this forgiveness all the time. And really, to close, I'd like to tell you that if we keep our eyes open on this beginning, every day we see it in all relations, in all encounters, and we can participate in it. In uh, you know, meeting a great person like uh, Florenko, like uh, Dante, the bad girl, or the encounter with uh, a student that I know, one who really is um, so terrible. He participates in a music evening with his teachers. You know, you wouldn't pay five cents for that young guy, but, uh, you know, he wrote to me from tonight, I know Italy will not go rotten. You know, this declaration, this statement, uh, had uh, a um, great uh, cultural uh, importance. Uh, really, a guy you would not pay five cents for, but you know, he says uh, after a meeting uh, with his uh, teachers after a music evening, he says Italy will not go rotten, there's future for myself. I was really struck by this. He said, the bad things around me will die at my feet. I'm there, please count on me. The evil is won. There are pieces of a beginning where in our lives, what we have heard about actually happens. This is what started um, 2,000 years ago where the um, Holy Father shared uh, or started looking at the state of mankind and maybe said something like uh, human being a state of emergency. He must have called the other two partners of his cooperative saying it's really an, a state of emergency. These people have to find their face again. They have to find themselves again. The story of this woman waiting for death because there's nothing more to wait from the um, haze of a confused memory. You know, it's like um, putting the picture in acid. Very soon you will get a picture out of this. This, uh, the woman we've heard about who did not remember the face of her mother and then uh, slowly remembers it. I'd like to close this meeting with a present uh, to my friend Filonenko and to you, remembering uh, simply that, uh, and people say I always have uh, fixed ideas, but in the 33rd canto of the Paradise, Dante, when mentioning the ultimate goal of life and the adventure he has described, says in a sequence that we will read together these days, asking the Madonna for the grace that all clouds become disrupted. 
and obtains this grace uh, and uh, sees many things in God's uh, eyes, but above all, sees one face, that face, the face you can always start from because it's mercy. His nature is um, mercy. In God's heart, Dante sees uh, a man's face and finds himself. The haze goes away, is dispelled, and it's uh, clarity that you receive, a force which is not your own. It's a force which comes not for what you can do, but for what you participate in. You give to life a face. I found myself. I think we can all say uh, thanks to Filonenko for giving us this uh, testimony, one uh, here and now for all. Thank you.